sometimes, what your eyes see, what you have. Huh? You can't have the temptation. Sometimes thoughts come to your mind. It's, oh my God, I'm a reprobate. What am I thinking I've been for? Oh my God, I'm... You know, all of a sudden you're repenting. Oh my God, I'm going to fast for 20 days. I've been like, damn, oh my God, don't do Temptations must come, and they come from a thought. It begins. Sometimes it's what you've smelled, what you've heard, what you've tasted, what you've touched, what you've seen. The five gateways to your soul. They have to come in a form of thought. As Billy Graham has said many times, it's not the first thought, which is the temptation that kills you, it's the entertainment of that thought. So when a mood hits you, watch now, everybody still with me? When a mood hits you, don't entertain it. Ooh. I didn't even see heads nod at me. Listen, you still with me? How many still love me? Right here. Right here. Now, you don't entertain the mood. Don't feed it. You'll make everybody around you uncomfortable, and they won't want to be with you. How many know that nobody wants to hang around a moody person? It's a, and I'm going back. All of this is about the volition. The volition is choices that we make that control our behavior. How many understand that your pastor does wake up from time to time on the wrong side of the bed? No, not our pastor. He's perfect. Just ask Diane. She'll tell you. I don't always wake up perfect and on the right side of the bed. There are times that I wake up and there's a particular mood that I'm in. But I know better whether it's my body that's aching or whether it's something I ate last night or supper or something that uh, I had to deal with the day before it, and, or just simply for no reason at all. There are times that I fall into melancholic moods. Last Sunday afternoon, after such a great service on Sunday morning, I went into a melancholic uh, mood. But I analyzed it and I said, I don't have a reason for this. I'm not going to feed it. I don't need to feed it. I don't need to make room for it. I don't need it. Diane certainly doesn't need it in her life. I don't understand what I'm saying. People around you don't need wrong choices. So from your volition, the will of God for our life is to always demonstrate or try by the grace of God to demonstrate that godliness, that, that, that divine mood of love and compassion, that mood of serving others and not looking to be served. Looking to give a blessing rather than looking for attention and looking to be uh, blessed. How many understand this? So it's a volition. And the last thing in here before I go into my teaching, I haven't started on tonight yet. The last one on it is desire. Everybody say desire. desire. The, the word will is also defined in the term desire. Because how do you know that what you desire, your will, will commensurate? If you have a desire for something, like if you, if you have a desire to get a fancy car or a fancy boat or if you want a fancy house or if you want anything fancy, whatever the case might be, and you can't really afford it, but all of a sudden, the desire overwhelms and connects with the emotion. The desire now dominates the thought. The desire now drives the volition. The next thing you know, we're above our head. We're, we're way above our head. And so the will, okay, needs with the volition to control that sense of, of perspective. So desire is part of the will. Uh, the, 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 the reverse side of that, watch now, is that desire should be ours to always do the right thing regardless of how we... How many ever woke up on a Sunday morning and didn't feel like coming to church? How many know that the will had to jump in? Will had to override the feeling. Everybody say feeling. There's the mood. There's the mood again. I wasn't in the mood to go to church. Well, on your mood, you up yourself and move your hind into the church. You know, how do you know that, that the serving the Lord is not based on our moods? 
cut low. So try it with it. Try, try that with your electric bill. Not in the moon. The pay. The my electric bill is low. Electric company said, I'm not in the mood to give you any more electricity. Pull the plug. He said, I'm not in the mood to pay the house mortgage or the rent. Not in the mood. That's fine. Here's your eviction notice. You, 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 you understand what I'm saying? So there are some things. How many ever was in the mood not to pay your mortgage? And your bill? I was. I've been there. I've been there. Or pay the credit card bill. You know, I'm not in the mood to pay that. But you're the one that got into that. But so you know, you're not in the mood to pay. So what I'm saying is that whether did you notice that with those things, whether you're in the mood or not, you do it anyway. Amen. You whether you're in the mood to pay the electric bill, the mortgage, the, the rent, or the car payment, whether you're in the mood to do it or not, you do it anyway. Your will is there to do it because you know it's a necessity of life. Can we convert that into our walk with God? Yes. Our worship for the Lord? Whether you're in a mood to worship or not, you do it, man. You just do it because it's important for you to do. You owe God to worship Him. Yes. Amen. We all owe God to worship Him. We owe God. We are the, and Romans chapter 8 tells us, we are not debtors to the flesh, but to the Spirit. I owe flesh nothing. The flesh destroys people, but the Spirit gives life. Amen. I owe God. How many feel that you owe God? You see? Amen. And watch now. Every time you obey and crush the mood and just do the right thing, you're making another house payment. Amen. That's good, bro. That's good. Every time you choose to do the right thing, you've just made another credit card payment. You just made another mortgage payment. You just paid another electric bill. You just caught up on everything. Amen. Every time you choose to do the right thing. Now, I'll give you tonight's message. Now, it's going down a little behind on that. Now, ladies, you're going to enjoy this. <laughs> Men, you will understand where I'm coming from. Does anybody, when, when, uh, <laughs> okay, brother, you better come stand by me. I may need some protection. What I've done. <laughs> you got me coming. <laughs> okay. Right. Gentlemen, how many of you have been around a young lady or a wife or whatever? And you're all ready to step out the door. Then your wife says, hold on. I don't like this dress. I'm going to go in and change my dress. You're going to do what? You say, well, you're going to do what now? We're in the car, honey. The car's running. The car, no, don't do that, honey. No. She goes back in the house. Fifteen minutes later, she tried on three dresses. And mama comes out with another dress on. And husband has been praying in tongues, in a heavenly language, asking God for self edification to stand strong, not to murder anybody. Long suffering. Long suffering. <laughs> and what does mama say? It's a woman's prerogative to change her mind. That ain't what mine says. What did I tell you? I told you like this. <laughs> it's a woman's it's a woman's prerogative. Change her mind. And then the man says, I don't even know what you just said, sweetheart, but it sounds good that I'm with you. We just move on. It's a woman's choice or a woman's prerogative. Let me give you the 13th century Latin of where the word prerogative came from. <laughs> it's Roman uh, Latin. Should have told that Latin story. Name. That the word prerog in the Latin means first. Okay. Augative, the rest of it means choice. So now it brings down to where we understand each other. Back in the days of the Roman Empire, and on from there, 
around me because this was a practice that was made for thousands of years, hundreds of years. And the Roman Empire, they... Um, did we not have... Did we not have games? Who's first on whatever the game is that we're going to play? Who's first? Uh -huh. No, not who's on second, who's on first. Not that one. Abbott and Costello. But you know, who's, who's going to... For instance, if you're going to have a softball game, a scrap, a scrap game, and then you, you, you say, well, who's going, to, who's going to choose first? Okay, so they're, they're, they're going to set teams now. Now, back in the Roman Empire, uh, they, they, the senators and the representatives and whatnot, along with Caesar, they would all they decide who would have the first choice. That's what prerogative means. In the 13th century Roman Latin, it means first choice. Watch now. And or the privilege of first choice. That's what prerogative means. Now, how does that convert to the will of God? I thought about all of this today, brother. This is hot off the press. When I thought about the will of God, I thought about the prerogative of God. And let me tell you this and learn from it big time tonight. God has the right to us to have the first choice in our life. Amen. 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 It's God, God's not my prerogative. No, I don't have the prerogative where God is concerned. Jonah, God gave Jesus the right for the first choice first one to make a decision when it comes to you and I or to us to him. He has the right to make the first choice. Amen. Is that good? Yes. When we talk, Brother Dave, about God's will, we're actually talking about God's prerogatives. Yes. But if you have to understand, to appreciate God's prerogative, you must understand the word the Latin and understand it means the privilege of first choice. When it comes to my moods, my behaviors, my attitudes, my will to serve him, it is God's prerogative first, not mine, to make the decision. And I follow that decision. I choose to obey God's will, God's choice, and God's decision. God's right to first choice in my life. How many feel in this room tonight and those watching by YouTube and listening by CD that for those who call themselves Christians that we turned over the reins of our life and said, Lord, you guide, you lead, you have the steering wheel of my life. Did we not say that to the Lord? Amen. I'll yes. go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. We gave God the prerogative. That's it's good new kid, new fed coming up all over the place here. New fed counseling. <laughs> Most of you don't know what that is. She knows. But listen closely. When we gave our life to Jesus, Brother Leo, we gave him the privilege of first choice where we are concerned. How many know that your life and my life is not our own? Amen. We're bought with a price. We belong to Him. We've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's His prerogative. Now, let me give you a scripture in Psalms 75. In fact, it was called a special right or special privilege, privilege granted to someone. It was a special right. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. Uh, Jocelyn's not there. It, it's, hey, Jameson, you were late for church, so. I, I have a good excuse. Yeah, okay, as long as you have a good excuse. <laughs> well, what, watch now, watch now. Look here. Look, look here, watch now. Now, I'm teaching you something about God's prerogative. 
God's prerogative. For exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. Exalted, stop there for a second. Exaltation. In other words, uh, have, have you ever have you ever run, run into somebody and said, How come God has blessed that person? If I was God, I wouldn't bless that person. Uh, uh, you wanna, how many wish that this world didn't have people in it that are like uh, Hitler, Adolf? How many wish this world didn't have people in it like Adolf Hitler? Mussolini in Italy. The slaughters of people in Iraq, 250,000 by ISIS. How many wish that that didn't happen? How many wish that we didn't have a half a million children dying every day of starvation? And then we have, because these people that are so selfish, who are oil-rich nations, who are a, like, you know, like the Sudan, the Sudan, the north is Muslim, the south is Christian, and, and they always try to abduct young ladies, to rape them, sell them into prostitution, so on and so forth. So you wish that all of Sudan was Christian, but they, but you see, then you ask yourself then why does God allow prosperity to come to these people? And you wonder, so exaltation or being raised or highly brought up into place of prominence neither comes from the east, the west, or the south, or the north. Promotion comes from the Lord, the Bible says. As a matter of fact, Look at verse 7 now, right now, Genesis. Look at verse 7 now. But God is the judge. Everybody say, God is the judge. God is the judge. And we need to leave those questions in the judge. Everybody say, He come to judge. He come to judge. He come to judge. The matters of who prospers in this world and who doesn't is none of our business. Amen. That's right. Those who live long lives and those who seemingly die on time of death, none of our business. Those are facts that you read about tonight we can do nothing about. Problems are ours, ours to solve, but facts. If it's going to rain outside, that's a fact. Can't do it. If it's 106 degrees out there, quit complaining about it, just move on. There's nothing you can do about it. It's in God's hands. So he said, God is the judge. So who is exalted and prosperous in this world is none of our business. God judges that. God decides that. That's in his sphere of choice and decision. God is the judge. Watch now. He says he puts down one and exalts the other. Then it's like a chessboard, Brother Dave. All of a sudden, the one that was up is now down. The one that's down is now up. Case in point, Joseph in Egypt, he's in prison. Next thing you know, he's the prince of Egypt. He takes one down, puts the other one up, takes one that's up, bring down, bring the other up. That's God's choice. Amen. Put it this way, it's God's prerogative. Because he has the privilege and the special right of first choice. Now, have you, have you ever seen on television the people who reject the notion of God? For them, the notion of God is a silly thought. Silly thought. One has to be moronic to think of God, but certainly to pray as though God hears you. Yeah. Moronic, because you're so weak as a character, you have to use God as some kind of a crutch. They laugh and scorn at people because they say, 
These are weak people. We've heard from the White House in certain instances in the past. Speaking of vice president, did he talk about that? Yeah, yeah. See, now watch now. And then we have people out of Hollywood who insult believers and even those who have been in the high ranking politics that we are the deplorables, incorrigibles, and certainly we shop at Walmart from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> Old uh, brother John Walton, uh, Sam Walton, he had uh, he had a great notion, a good, great job he did. It's one of the biggest employers of the world, isn't it? Walmart. One time. One of the largest. Walmart and Amazon, two biggest in the world. The two biggest in the world. And you have a nerve to, cr to criticize one of the two biggest companies in the world. You, you you're not in a position, young lady, to criticize Walmart. You're not in. You're not in. You're, yeah, that's that's out of your range, honey. Way out of your. You're, that's not even. You're not even in the ballpark. Don't even go there. But now look at him. People who evaluate God, you see them in the news, you see them when they're being interviewed, and they evaluate, they evaluate God. Say, if there was a God, he's not doing it right. And these people are trying to Describe God's job. Because God's not acting much like a God, in their opinion. And they're trying to define God's portfolio, his responsibilities. You remember 9-11? Mm -hmm. On NBC back in the day? And that young, that lady that was one of the main anchors of the early morning show, I don't remember her name right now. Anchor. Huh? Katie Kirk. Katie Kirk. Exactly right. Where was God in all this? One nine eleven happened. Where was God? So she brought in Billy Graham's daughter. and asked her over national television, when 9-11 happened, young lady, where was God at? Oh, he was there. Your problem is that you kicked him out of school. You kicked God out of the courthouse. You kicked God out of hospitals, out of colleges. You've laughed and scorned, and you're complaining that he didn't do his job? Are you going to define his job now? Who are you? So is the people try to tell God what his job description is. How dare they? When they don't know God, nor do they even begin to believe and trust and submit humbly before God. Amen. I'm going to tell you something tonight very, very clearly. God is the judge. He puts one up and he puts one down. Then he puts that down up. And the up, down. He is the judge and his prerogative. Amen. It is God's prerogative. But we know that those who reject God, there is a final judgment. Amen. And let me tell you that those who laugh at and scorn and make fool and ridicule of God and those who walk with God and claim that as the vice president he talks with God and God speaks to his heart and that is so demeaning it's just such a, de a, de a demented position to be in as far as society is concerned there's a judgment now how many know that God is, Jesus is returning whether we like it or not Amen. that's his prerogative is that correct? <laughs> whether I believe in the second coming or not, now that doesn't change the second coming. It's coming whether I believe it or not. Right, right. And there's a judgment day coming whether I like it, believe it, or accept it or not. That's right. 
Nothing changes God's prerogative because God has been given the right to the special right to choose first. Amen. He has that right. It's his prerogative. He is the one that puts men into position. How many are glad that God has still chosen in his volition, his choice, decision, and determination, and his prerogative to bless America, the United States of America? How many are glad that God chose in his eternal will to bless this nation, the most powerful, the most prosperous? He chose to do that. As he chose to do that for Israel. And people don't like that. In Israel, we have the four in the squad of the Democratic Party that are angry about Israel, complaining constantly about Israel. Condemning them because they're the ones creating the mess around the world. Israel is chosen by God. That's a fact whether you like it or not. And there's nothing, young lady, you can do, will do, or otherwise even dream of doing about it. And the United States of America will support Israel. We'll stand behind Benjamin Netanyahu. As Israel is not always perfect, the United States is not always perfect. Guess what? Neither are we always perfect. Amen. But we know the perfect one is with us regardless. Amen. And that determination has been made. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Amen. So what we're saying tonight, it's important for us to see the will of God as something that God has predetermined in his counsel. And there's nothing we can do about it. We can't fight it. We can't resist it. The best thing we can do is say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Say along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, let it be done to me according to what you have said. Amen. Amen. Because if God has chosen you and he has to be part of his sheepfold, be part of his family, then he has blessings in store. He has marvelous things in store for you that you cannot believe. You will not be able to comprehend all the things that God has for you in this life and in the life to come. Jesus gave us a hint about that in Matthew 6. He said, be careful. He said, don't be asking for houses, properties, and money, and gold, and so on and so forth. All material things. Don't do that. He said, the pagans and the heathens, that's what they're looking for. He said, not for you. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Somebody shout praise the Lord. And God made a choice, a prerogative, his first choice, that if you will seek him and his will and seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he chose to give you, to give you in this world all these things will overtake you, overrun you. His blessings will be granted to you by the mother Lord every single day. And in the, not only in this world, Jesus said, but in the world to come. Amen. Amen. He's made that de predetermination of his volition, his will, his desire, his choice. His prerogative has been to bless those who trust him. Somebody shout at me. It's God's prerogative to bless those who believe in him. It's his prerogative to give strength to the weak, healing to the sick, deliverance to those who are in bondage, and to give hope to otherwise the hopeless in this world, to give the light to those who are in darkness, and to open the blind eyes, and to open deaf ears, and to make the lame walk, and to raise the dead. Somebody shall amen tonight. God has made that prerogative real for us. It's ours to enjoy while we're alive now. He brought heaven on earth. Through Jesus Christ. If you want to know what heaven's about, find out what Jesus is all about. Amen. Oh, that is good. That is good. Amen. If you want to know what heaven's about, find out what Jesus is about. Amen. And you'll know everything about heaven. Hallelujah. If you don't like the notion of discovering Jesus, then don't go to heaven. You'll be very uncomfortable and unhappy. <laughs> Give me a wait. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. If the idea of discovering more about Jesus doesn't suit you very well, don't go to heaven. You will not be happy there at all. 
very discontented, guess what? You'll be moody. <laughs> How many know there's no moody people in heaven? Let's just give our life to the Lord and say, you have your way in my life. I see, this is, these are all my notes for the past hour. That's it. Ephesians 3, and I'm going to turn with this now. Ephesians 3, 10 to 12. Genesis, Ephesians 3, 10 to 12. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities, powers, and the heavenly place. By now, right now, God shows this. His prerogative is to make known to principalities, the world, and, and powers in heavenly places, the wisdom of God. Well, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. That was God's prerogative. And he executed his prerogative, his choice. I choose to give the world wisdom through the church. Amen. God says, I choose that. It's my prerogative. I have chosen, I have chosen to let the principalities, the powers of the air, and the worlds of this world to know my wisdom through the church. He chose that. That was his prerogative. Verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he has accomplished in Christ Jesus. According to the eternal purpose. See the word eternal purpose. Everybody say it together. Eternal purpose. One more time. Eternal purpose. So when we talk about the will of God, we're talking about purpose of God. We said that earlier. The will of God, watch now. Once that, once that God has manifested his purpose and his volition, his prerogative. That prerogative is laid down in cement. Amen. That will never change. How do you know that God will never change his mind about you? Amen. Isn't that right, Miss Amen? God loves you. And they know that's hard enough. But anyways, but God. <laughs> I love doing it to him. He's easy to pick on. God loves you and he'll never change his mind about that. He that's his prerogative. The right to the first choice to love us, Brother John, Sister John, he'll never change his mind. That will never change. That's written down in the eternal purpose of God. He said he'd be with us always to the end. That's his prerogative, and that will never change. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. That will never change. Amen. According to the eternal purpose, so. God has a purpose, eternal purpose, not for now only, but for eternity, to show this world and the principalities, unseen principalities of the air, the wisdom of God. And that wisdom of God talks about the redemptive plan of Christ through the cross of Calvary in his blood. Verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. 